Summer in uh, the Med, winters in the Caribbean. But is the price of finding births getting more expensive? We've heard some evidence earlier today that it is. We've also heard reference to uh, bad weather events making births more difficult. Are, are more uh, births more difficult to find? In fact, are the bigger, bigger yachts finding it more difficult to find births? To answer those questions, we have Matthew Solomon, Technical Director, Campbell Nicholson Marinas, and Tony Brown, Marina Director, Porto Negro. And I'm going to invite both, starting with Mature, to share their opening thoughts about this, please. Well, uh, good afternoon, first and foremost. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, as Camp Nicholson's Marinas, we obviously have experience with uh, catering for yachts in, in the super yacht market uh, range, anything from uh, 30 meters up to 160 meters. Mm. Catering for yachts of this size is very challenging for the simple reasons that they consume huge amounts of power, huge amounts of water. I mean, to give you a typical indication, a typical UK household consumes 0.5 kilowatts. A yacht in excess of 100 meters consumes 500 kilowatts, so it's about 5,000 times the capacity of a household. Gosh. So building facilities to cater for those mega yachts on, in some cases, remote islands where the, the grid won't necessarily cope with the, you know, the power demands is obviously a challenge in itself. It, does, it doesn't just stop there, it's, it's, it ranges from power, it ranges from supplying these, these, these ships in effect with uh, entertainment for, for the crew on board, because as we were discussing earlier, this will play a pivotal role on where the ship, on the, where the yacht will go. So having just infrastructures is not necessarily the only ingredient that one must consider. Okay, thank you for that. Tony? Yeah, I, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, I haven't been to China, don't worry. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, the facilities that are required and the amenities and underpinning industries that are needed in the more remote places, so I can speak for uh, Porto Montenegro, which is um, obviously a, a new and exciting destination in many respects. Um, we do have a bit of legacy value as well, but we've created something there from scratch, an industry in the Adriatic um, that requires this hub um, for the yachts to facilitate their, their owners and, and guests. Um, this, this comes at a cost. This comes at a huge um, human resource challenge. It comes at uh, a, a, a big challenge of negotiation with the government and the infrastructure of the country that's required to power these boats and supply the, uh, the infrastructure. So, yeah, it is a challenge. Um, but I think also in many respects creating yachting destinations from new can in some ways be easier than retrofitting those destinations that we do have already in the Mediterranean in particular um, as the yachts increase in size and technical capability. Okay, but what, what's driving that? Is, is it simple supply and demand and the limited number of berths in Sud de France that everyone wants to go there, their price is going up so people are looking elsewhere? Is it as simple as that, Tony? Uh, I mean, I, there, is a, there is a limited supply of berths, and particularly in the summer months in the, in the south of France, uh, Cote d'Azur, um, across Spain and some of the Italian ports, it is very difficult to find a location. Um, I think the owners, as we've seen, are getting more um, interested in moving further afield and enjoying some uh, more remote and interesting cruising destinations. Um, but that will never replace those traditional cruising grounds that um, have driven the prices up because, of, because they can. Sure. They, they really can. Mathieu, is that your experience too? It's a very interesting debate actually and, and one I'd, I'd love to talk about because you'll find that the, soup, the, the, uh, the typical super yacht owner is not someone who waits in line and when he wants something he's got the money and he's got the final say. And uh, it's a known fact that the, the popular areas such as the Côte d'Azur, the south, south of France, that is where I would say the majority of these people want to be. And it's also, ironically, the place which is least equipped to deal with yachts of this size. When you look at, for example, some of the marinas on Tibes and Monaco, they don't necessarily have very modern infrastructures. Then you can go you know, to, I would say, Saudi Arabia or Dubai, where they've got marinas which have recently been built to cater extraordinary, in extraordinary ways for these yachts. But no one wants to be there. I mean, yes, the weather is nice, but ultimately it's not a, it's not a question of what, you know, just, simply, just catering for these yachts. It's a question of demographics. That is, I would say, the most important um, attribute yes. in terms of where these yachts will go. 
So uh, if we are looking at increasing competition for super yacht berths, is that across the board or is it localised in terms of competition for the very biggest super yachts? I would say it's a, it's a combination of both. Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that your experience too? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is it possible to track how much berths are rising uh, in, at the most popular uh, desti- uh, uh, home ports like Antibes, for example? And we've all, we've all heard the apocryphal stories of, of, of berths being bought for pennies and sold for millions. But can, can you give us any more information about that, Mathieu? Uh, well, to give you specifics, it would be difficult because it's, um, within the company we have a dedicated team who actually work on heat maps and, and look at you know, marketing trends and look at uh, this data so on, a, you know, on a day-to-day basis. But the fact of the matter is the super yacht industry is growing. The yachts are getting bigger and beamier. When, you know, in, in the current clim- world climate, you'd have thought people wouldn't be investing in this sort of asset, I would say. So, yes, it's a question of... Uh, these people are on the increase, they are buying and showing more interest in yachts ranging from 30 meters all the way up to 150 meters, which is, you know, close to 500 foot. So to understand the sheer size of that, I mean, it's no longer a yacht, it's, it's a ship in effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tony, any, any take on, on quantifying the increase in competition or price for the biggest berths? Um, I think it's, again, it comes down to supply-demand imbalance, and, and that, um, that increase in the price of those biggest berths is really only seen in the hotspot locations. Yeah. Um, there are other locations. And that's locations. where we would expect to be Antibes, be Monaco. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's purely supply-demand imbalance. And, you know, what's interesting as well is um, it's almost like there's, there's a secret ingredient out there as to why people do continue to frequent those locations. It's, it's it, beautiful. It's a wonderful place. It's arguably overcrowded. It's overdone. It's um, not as interesting as some of these newer locations around the world, yet it still retains the, um, the absolute top of the, uh, the pile in terms of, of desire to berth your boat in these locations. So, um, and presumably that isn't going to change any time soon. You never know. You know, how, how are you going to change it then? How are you going to seduce yacht owners into, into your port? I, I think that there, there are ways of, I would say, you know, uh, influencing it. And, I, you know, the few captains I've spoken to, I've heard, and again, you know, I'm, I'm no expert, but I've heard that the crew mm. and the captain have a, a considerable say in where the yachts go as opposed to the owner. Uh, so true. being able to cater and provide... Democracy on board super yachts? That's that's, this is what I understand. I mean, the, 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 the owners are very rarely on board. I'm talking about, obviously, right. the, the, the mega stuff. And, yeah. and it's more often than not, it's up to the captain to decide in the yeah. best interests of his crew and his yacht yeah. where he's going to get the best service, where he's going to be able to carry out some refit work, which is obviously a very important aspect. So I think there are ways of catering for that yeah. particular area which could potentially influence. Okay. Tony, have you noticed any evidence of super yachts becoming workers' collectives? Not particularly in our neck of the wood, no. No. Um, I don't know if you have. What do you? No, what, what I'm getting at is, is, is um, the, the ability of the crew to direct the direction of the boat, as it were. Um, I mean, so maybe a bit of background. So I spent 10 years on yachts. Um, the last one was a 40 metre that we were building, a new build in, in Turkey, which led to going to Porto Montenegro. When I started at Porto Montenegro, um, I took my experience from uh, yachts and marinas in order to create what uh, the investor's aspiration was to make the best facility that had ever been built before. Yeah. Um, and that was coming from a yachting point of view. Now, having all of the amenities and ticking all of the boxes that the crew the captains and the owners need and want is one part of the, the ingredient. And yes, the crew um, and the captains do have some level of influence into where those boats go. I mean, we heard earlier that um, there's a desire for some older captains to be uh, rotational yep. and other crew to be rotational, yet there's a newer wave of crew that are coming up that are more than happy to, to work mm. as hard as they can and, and, mm. and do what is required. So if they can direct the boat to a, a, an alternative location that they don't have to worry about the scarcity of, of berthing options such as Montenegro, then, then they do have so, some influence, yes. So would you put it as strongly as because of the best crew's desire for rotation, that's affecting where some yachts go? 
Oh, I wouldn't say it has anything to do with ro so. rotation. No, no it's, okay. it's it's more of uh, I mean answering your question as yeah. as to whether there's influence yeah. on board and, yeah. and 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 there is, but it's it depends again. It's so different and varied. It depends on the relationship with the crew, captain, yeah. and owner. So aside from the view outside your super yacht, to what extent do tax regimes, VAT regimes, maintenance plans influence where people choose to? Uh, to moor their yacht. And we might hear from Terry, who we heard from earlier, who might have a view on this. But do, could you tell us where, it, how influential, if at all, that is? Well, well, it's a very interesting point, and I would say that's extremely influential. Like everything else in life, ultimately money talks. And if you're going to be saving the owner considerable amounts of money in terms of salaries, in terms of tax regimes, in terms of entertainment, in terms of lodging costs, then obviously the owner is going to be keen on that subject to the size of his yacht. At some point, you know, it becomes insignificant with respect to the running costs of the yacht. You know, mm. if we're talking about a 120 meter yacht, which could potentially run 10 to 15 million euro per year running costs, whether he's got a tax regime in one country or another, could, you know, it, yeah. could, it could be influential. I know, obviously, Malta offers some advantages on that, and there's quite a strong delegate. Port of Barcelona also, I believe. Claims. Yes, there's a few yeah. other hotspots who are now obviously being considered as high competition yeah. for the existing South, South Côte d'Azur. Uh, and, and would that be a more seductive argument, perhaps, for the smaller boats, where cost savings might be generally thought to be more important, or is that irrelevant? I think it's across the board, personally. I mean, no one wants to throw away large amounts of money, regardless of how rich they are. Mm. So I think, in my experience, it's across the board. When I look at some of the super yachts that come to Malta, in one of the marinas we, we run and operate there, we own and operate there, there's a variety of super yachts ranging from the 30 all the way through to the 100 meter mm. Length overall yeah. band. Okay. Uh, Tony, what's your take on the uh, tax and regulatory landscape affecting uh, choice of berth? Well, I mean, Montenegro is a particular case because it's outside of the EU. It has uh, very favourable tax conditions. Um, obviously, vessels need to leave the EU every 18 months, so I do see a consistent flow of vessels coming to Montenegro in order to achieve that. Um, we sell uh, duty-free, tax-free fuel as well, which is a big, big um, driver of... of customers into Montenegro. Uh, those yachts that we do have based there year round um, benefit from uh, fiscal advantages as well within the local taxation administration system in terms of setting up companies, um, corporate taxes, that sort of thing. So uh, it is an influence, but again, I think it's scalable. So perhaps not so much for the larger, the larger vessels that are perhaps a little yep. bit less price sensitive, but uh, the mid-range, yeah, we, we definitely see um, an impact and, and it's a decision-making process. So to what extent are we seeing a ripple effect where competition in Antibes pushes out to competition in, well, Montenegro, Port of Spain and the other locations as well? Please talk about the ripple effect in berth pricing, if there is one. Well, that for me is, 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 is quite visible and evident when you look at um, the, the uptake on marinas that are embryonic. A few super yachts that start to birth there, the, the following year, it increases purely and simply because crew interact and crew want to be where other super yachts are. So yes, the minute, you know, a destination, and it's not a marina, it's a destination. You know, someone doesn't go there just to berth their boat. They go there for the package, whether it being the real estate that surrounds the marina or a multitude of other reasons. So yes, the ripple effect is evident. Competition obviously exists. And, you know, we find in, in all the marinas that we, we, we are involved in, uh, currency, uh, not currency, but um, birth, birth rates is something we're constantly looking at to be more competitive. Okay. Do you see that ripple effect? Yeah, I mean, we maintain what we call the Bible. So we try and look at uh, pricing across the entire med. We look at our region in, in far more detail. Um, we try and remain as competitive as, as we can. But, uh, you know, the, the topic of this talk, as you've seen in the, in the brochure there, was, you know, investment in, yeah. in marinas. It does cost money to create and maintain and operate marinas. Mm. Um, we need to make a return. Uh, you know, at the very least, there's, there's break-even costs. But uh, for our investors, they're not in it for the, for the love of it. They do want to make some money. Yeah. Um, so it's remaining competitive, it's trying to grow the occupancy in the marina as, as much as you can, it's, it's what the market can bear basically and, and I think uh, that's, that's uh, certainly where the newer destinations are at. The older destinations, the more established destinations that, that have that supply demand imbalance can arguably command higher prices which I think we're, we're seeing yeah. in the industry. And do you think that trend towards higher prices is inexorable? 
given the growth in high net worth individuals, given what we heard today, that the total addressable market for the otting industry uh, was uh, far from being realised. I would actually like to think that you get what you pay for beyond supply-demand imbalance. So, you know, I'd like to see, uh, as we have done, and I know Camper Nicholson do as well, and, and many other marinas, um, really raise the bar of the standards that are being offered in marinas, mm. um, which justifies the pricing that is being paid um, for a marina berth beyond mm. the fact that it's the only way you're going to get a berth. But do you think supply and demand will tend to drive berthing prices up across the board? given we're not making more land, environmental controls are getting tighter. In fact, we're losing land to global warming. It's the trend at the moment. Yeah. 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 Mathieu. Yeah, and I definitely agree that this is ultimately going to be the driving factor for prices going up. And when you look at many marinas in existence in these hotspots, there isn't much space to exploit further. More, more people owning boats, especially more... Network, high net worth individuals owning boats who want to be in these hotspots is just going to push the prices up. So yes, it's just going to continue going on, on, on the rise, in my opinion. Okay, all right. Um, so we, we have some questions which have uh, flicked up. Are birth fees getting out of hand? Surely not. Uh, an example, the Ibiza Old Town, 3,000 euros um, a night as opposed to 400 euros in the south of France. Um, is that sustainable? Is it realistic? I expect we accept it's true, <laughs> or maybe you want to dispute that. Uh, it's a very difficult question for me to answer. My, my, my job is really designing the marinas, so I don't, designing and building them, so I don't really get involved in the day-to-day -day operation, but I, I would have thought it's, it's basically what you, the, the demand, the demand drives the price. So if there's a huge demand in an area and they're full, versus another location which has less occupancy, then obviously they're going to be more flexible on lowering their mm. prices. I don't think you can say one rule fits all. It's, it's, it's purely down to supply and demand, okay. I would have thought. I, Tony? I think in that particular case, it's also capitalising on a, what is arguably a very short season as well. I mean, it's not particularly known as a year-round destination, and during the yeah. season, which is literally two, three months, um, they try and capitalise on that short period of time. Is, is it correct? Is it... Um, you know, sustainable, I think it probably probably is. Is it correct? It's up to the eyes of yeah. the beholder. Okay. You talked a moment ago about, about ports increasing the level of service offered to, uh, to boats. Can you perhaps talk a little more about that and how it's likely to develop? Yeah, I mean, the yachts are becoming um, increasingly sophisticated. They're, they're more and more difficult to run. The management companies, um, the captains and crew on board do a fantastic job in creating a seamless, enjoyable environment for the charter guests and owners to, uh, to really enjoy their family time in very mm. short periods as well mm. at, at great cost. And so supporting that to a level... I mean, our philosophy in, in Puerto Montenegro, for instance, was um, the crew are providing a seven-star service service to the people on board, the guests on board, and we would like the crew to feel that they are receiving that service when they step into the marina. Yeah. Um, and I'm seeing that trend more and more across marinas uh, around the Mediterranean and the world um, to make it easy for them to operate and provide sure. what they need to provide. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's nice to hear Tony speak like that because I couldn't agree more. When you're you know, servicing, when you're providing facilities for yachts of this size and you see how the crew on board are completely dedicated to providing a seven-star service, it's only normal that you provide the same service to them. And I think that will give any marina operator or any super yacht uh, agent the upper and leading edge over the competition, the service you provide, because ultimately they are paying good money. Yeah, okay. Uh, and we've talked about how factors other than uh, destination, how tax regimes uh, attract uh, yachts. I have a specific question here. How much has the new legislation in France impacted it as a destination for the choice of yachts? Mathieu? Well, being French myself, I know that the, uh, the current legislation in France, and not just with respect to yachting, but with respect to anything, as you know, a lot of French wealthy individuals are moving, and the, the three, I would say, the three primary choices are Portugal, um, Malta is one, and I believe Cyprus too. So these are the alternatives that they're considering to take up residency. When it comes to the arts, it's the same thing. I would say France are doing a terrible job at you know, showing more interest in trying to draw or keep the net, the uh, wealthy French individuals, but there's a flip side to the coin and everyone else is benefiting from it. Okay. 
Tope? Yeah, it's a, it's a fine line to walk. Um, obviously, the governments are uh, trying to increase their revenue streams as much as they possibly can. Yeah. Um, safety, regulation and revenue streams is important. Um, but if you cross that line, then you will impact. Yeah. The, you know, you're going to kill the golden goose. Okay. Um, so it, it, they, they do need to be careful. Mathieu, I suspect we have at least one of your compatriots who'd like to uh, have a view on this. If we could have a microphone, please, to uh, the centre of the hall, if that's possible. Uh, we'll welcome comments from Thierry. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. I'm French as well. Um, I don't totally agree with you. Why? Because what are the concerns for a yacht? The concern is the taxation. A yacht is not taxed. Even if he's created a permanent establishment, he only will pay the VAT, which is due, if the VAT is due. So no tax is applicable, except for a French resident and a private boat. Socially, we have to comply with the EU regulation. We had a crisis about a year and a half ago with the question of how crew would be subject to French regulation. It's very clear now we have an agreement with the EU as long as you comply with certain time, which is six months, the time in the shipyard is not counted as being in France, etc. too. We can live with it, that's no problem. Custom-wise, in all EU, we apply the new custom code that was uh, produced uh, mid-2019. Uh, so we are all, all in the same rules. Okay, I know that when you live outside EU, you have different regulation. But, um, you know, is that a solution? By the way, I'm, as well, I'm a member of the Chamber of Commerce and uh, Antibes Arbor is uh, managed and uh, by the Chamber of Commerce, so I've got quite a lot of information on Antibes Arbor who had some problem, but it's solved now. Okay, thank you for that. Mathieu. Uh, well, thanks, first and foremost. It's, um, uh, it's nice to hear, obviously, uh, someone speak pro-France for a change. Um, first and foremost, it would be unfair to compare France to a non-EU country. So, obviously, my, my, uh, my argument is with respect to other EU states. And secondly, I must point out that the comment was more aimed at towards the actual individual as opposed to the yacht per se. So, yes, I understand. And I don't profess to be an expert on VAT for yachting, but I was more pointing out the comment with respect to the individual who is resident in France as opposed to the individual who moves residency. I was under the impression there were fiscal benefits of doing that. Okay, Tony? I, I think one could also um, argue, I mean, it's not for me to say whether it's right or wrong, but the, the question also was um, with regards to the impact. Um, is it right or wrong? That's, that's for the lawmakers to make uh, that decision. But will it have an impact? There is a potential impact if the crew are suddenly taxed um, whilst in the south of France when they can go next door and not be taxed. Um, and, as we mentioned before, they may have some influence on where the yacht will be. Um, will there be an impact? Potentially there could be, yeah. Do you think we're likely to see an impact of bad weather events on uh, the price of berths, particularly perhaps in the Caribbean or areas like that? Tony? Well, I mean, that's an interesting one. So, obviously, not last year, but 2000 and, where are we, 18 now, um, we saw the particularly bad storm um, that took out the breakwater in Rapallo mm. in, in Italy, um, and there were um, a number of yachts damaged in, in Monaco as well. Uh, the, the, the insurance companies obviously are feeling the impact of, of these situations. Um, will it have an impact on birth pricing? I'm not sure. Does it play a, a role in the decision-making process as to where a yacht is going to be and how safe and well-maintained that facility needs to be. I think if it doesn't, then it, then it really should. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Mathieu? Yeah, no, it's a very valid point, actually. When, if I, I can take two examples in the Caribbean or in the Med, where last year, if we start with the Med, we had the, one of the most severe storms on the 24th of Feb in Malta, which, mm. which according to statistics, was the equivalent of a Cat 1 hurricane. So obviously, you know, not having experienced any storms of that magnitude before, that will definitely impact. Uh, the, the thing to consider, though, is yachts of this size, they have a full meteorological system on board. So before the storm hits, they know about it long before anyone else does. And they don't normally hang around 
in storm conditions. When you look at the other side of the pond on the, in the Caribbean, we've seen a lot of marinas who are directly hit by strong Cat 5 hurricanes. So to say whether that's going to impact the price or not and how it will impact the price is a difficult question because I would have thought that people would avoid placing or berthing their yachts in, a, in an area that's prone to hurricanes. So the impact will be that these people would rather stay further south below the hurricane belt so that there will be a, a subsequent ripple effect which would potentially push the prices up in marinas that are located outside of the hurricane belt, whereas the ones within the hurricane belt will obviously lose business. Okay. Uh, final question, I think, on uh, Antipodean ports. We've got uh, the America's Cup coming up. We've had seen tax changes in Australia that's made it a much more uh, promising uh, destination, attractive destination. How do you see the, that its ability to attract super yachts? Well, the Australian government has, um, has shown that they're quite proactive towards the super yacht industry um, with their recent adaptation of, of uh, well, the, the change in legislation that allows commercially registered vessels to stay longer in Australian waters. Um, and that's really based around the fact that the America's Cup is coming up and they do believe that the vessels that are heading out there, they're going to want more than just um, go to, to go to New yeah. Zealand for the Cup, they'll then head on over to Australia. Um, unfortunately, Australia actually suffers from a lack of super yacht berths, um, which is, you know, a good scenario for those marinas that do have a few berths. Uh, they'll potentially put those prices up. Um, but it's, it's good news and, and a good future for Australia that they are proactive towards attracting this industry and, and continuing to grow it. Okay, thank you very much. I think we'll tie up this session on that note. Covered a lot of ground there. My thanks to Mathieu Salomon, uh, Technical Director, Campbell Nicholson Marinas, and also Tony Brown, Marina Director, Porto Negro. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.